Okay, time to build the final structure on section one, which is in this case Axton steel. And this is down in the far corner, as most of you know, just on the other side of this parking lot. So I'll be building this and these, well, this little section right here, which I'm going to use this for that. It's not exactly the same proportions, but it doesn't matter. But this building will, which is actually, it, it looks like it joins like this, like in the photo. But it's actually way back here in reality. But it doesn't matter, right? It's this backdrop. You can't tell with this photo either. Look. Looks like it's attached straight to the building here, doesn't it? This one. But it's way further back. So I'll use some other scrap siding material. Put a door in it. Push it back. There will be some trees in here and a fence. So by pushing it back like that you won't be able to tell and it'll enhance the perspective and the depth because there'd be some other stuff going on here like trains and forklifts and maybe I might I might later on scenery wise revise and have a, another tree up closer in this ground area here because I don't like the whole area is so empty and uh, there'll be trailers and other gack and stuff all around in details but I'll look at that later right like those are things I can decide later if I want to revise and change this scene to make it more appropriate to what I like visually but that's for another discussion so what I'm going to use here is some siding by Evergreen I'll talk about that in a second let me just show you the structure it's just 3 8 plywood box see it's the simple box with a plate at the back to reinforce it to keep the roof level and straight which is this 1 8 hardboard if you can build this out of whatever you want, but I had lots of 3 8s kicking around, so and I like a sturdy structure as you all know by now. And I just planed up the edges, made it nice and flush, and then I painted this with Varathane, waterborne Varathane. Why do I do that? Because when I go to glue my siding on, which I sand, and when I put the Varathane on it, it springs the grain out a bit and seals it. So when I put CA on here, it's not. This plywood, if you leave it raw, will sponge up the CA and it, it'll pull away from this and you won't get a good bond. Not as good as you would like. If you if you seal this with Varathane and then sand this and you glue it down, it's not coming off. I guarantee it's not coming off. You won't get it off without destroying it anyway. Now, I have two choices here. I have the choice to use board and batten, which is normally a wood application, but metal looks like this too 45 43 board and batten same spacing 100 thou by 40 thou or you can use this metal siding which i have five sheets of which i'm going to use 45 29 metal siding 100 thou by 40 thou there's the spacing and the thickness right thickness referring to the sheet spacing between the battens now before you apply these i want to just warn you about one thing i i almost i Look, I've made this mistake before, and it happens when you're in production. 
you say, okay, looks good, right? You glue it on, and then you glue the next one on, next one on, and then you realize, wait a minute, these lines aren't straight. Like here, look at this. When they cut this on the shear, they didn't line it up properly, see? Evergreen, somebody was having a bad day. Look, see how wide it is there? The line, I traced it against the batten all the way down, and look what happens when you get down here. See how narrow that is? So it's not square. Either side is not square. So I have to cut that line and square up these panels. So when I glue this on, I don't introduce a run out that will just magnify and multiply all the way down. So remember how I talked about that? So make sure your panels are square, okay? Before you glue them to your substructure. Okay, so there's a little bit of a seam line that shows here, uh, even though they're quite tight. So uh, what I do is I just take some of this golden high flow acrylics because it penetrates well and it dries fast. And what I'm going to do is just put a blob on there. just penetrates that line and whites it out nice so it's not as noticeable Okay, so there you have this. The walls now are skinned up. So it took five sheets to do all this. And then here, you won't see this part, but I, I used the scrap to fill this in because I'm not going to buy another sheet just for that piece there. All right. So one, two, three, four, five, and then the scrap. I used a strip there. pieces here. Okay, so now that the sides are framed up or skinned up, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out four millimeter along the base of this foundation. So this metal, so, so there would be a concrete foundation. So the wood, when I cut this strip away, the wood will represent the concrete. And then this will sit down inside the pavement enough. The pavement is about 3.5. Okay, it's 1 8 or so um, thick uh, balsa wood pavement. So there'll be a little bit of a gap, which is okay, because the metal siding sometimes goes right to the ground or it just sits a little bit above. So uh, I'm going to just cut 4 mil away from here. And then it'll sit nice and snug down into the concrete pad. 
or asphalt pad in this case. Okay, so I had to make a hobby shop run because for my roofing. Um, normally I would use the roofing material, but I don't want to build it up. Like when you buy the roofing uh, from Evergreen Scale Models, like it has the different widths, like, like it has a groove in it, right? Um, I'll show you quick on a piece of paper here. Like normally roofing, like the sheet looks like this with a groove in it whatever the spacing is for the scale that you want and then you got to glue they give you the strip like this you got to insert in there and glue it in so it sits up like this All right like you got to glue this in and I don't want to do that that's you know like if you're feeling masochistic <laughs> go ahead <laughs> But if you use this here, the board and batten, which is normally wood, right? But this looks just like uh, the ladder drawing that I showed you, like for roofing. So that's what I'm going to use here. So, you know, let's just tally up, like, what this costs. This is just a box, right? It's not the cheapest building in the world, I'll tell you right now. Because we had one, two, three, four, five, and then the scrap. So I'm paying, like, nine, ten dollars a sheet. So that's fifty dollars just to skin the front of this. And then the roof is another, well, 25, 30 bucks. So it's not a cheap building, right? Because of the sheet material. But it's un it will be unique. And by the way, when I was there at the hobby shop, look what I got. XF52 Flat Earth. There was three there. I left one. But uh, there hadn't been Earth there for months. Tamiya Earth. And then I picked up a buff. Just to throw that in, and uh, medium gray, XF20. And then some H column, which I'm going to use for around this the soffit and the roof lip here. And I'll show you that, or how I'm going to do that. And then the downspout, they're, they're, they're actually square. I was going to use uh, 80 by 80, but I decided that I would use, or, or no, a 100 by 100 thou but I'm going to use 80 by 80 just look it'll look better for scale wise and then it fits in under the H column but I'll show you how that pans out okay so before I cap the roof which is a very simple uh, application as well like the majority of this building uh, I need to build up the uh, fascia like roof lip or soffit or whatever you want to call it. I mean there is a little bit of a a packing out here. You can do it in different ways I guess. Um, I mean you can do it like like this is the uh, front face of the building and then here's the roof. So there's a piece that goes on here like this and then there's a sort of a fascia piece and then the the downspout tucks up underneath that so I want to simulate that because there isn't a lot of detail going on in this building and so I don't want to just glue it right to the surface because I don't believe it is on the prototype according to my photos and there is a lip where it goes up underneath so the water runs down runs into the the trough here just up above the lip and then drains off so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this H column number 284 and then I'm going to uh, glue it like this on first Okay, even though I'll probably, oops, sorry, uh, I'll probably cover, cover it like that because it drains in, like this drains off into little uh, scuppers, there are little scuppers along the top here, but uh, you can't see those anyway. So before I, I uh, lay the roof material on, I want to get that established. And then once I have that done, I'm going to use this uh, number 164, 80 by 80 thou for the square downspout. And if this is the fascia lip, 
then I want it to just tuck in like this fits in nice into that H column groove, which is how I see it or how I interpret the photograph. Okay, so like that. Okay, so I'm going to begin by tacking on this H column, just the end first, right? So that way I can stretch it or pull on it and get it nice and straight. And just put this square on top just to make sure it's push up so that it's square. So when you cap it with sheet, it'll line, it'll line up nice without a big gap there. You don't want that. You want to have this parallel, this edge to the roof all the way along. I like to cap first, or sorry, tag it. And I'll adjust the 45 later because it's on a little bit of a compound, it's a bit of a compound miter that you can just touch up with a knife or a sanding block. Notice how I cut a 45 scarf here. See, it's just a common practice that any finished carpenter knows. Well, I do it with model construction as well. Why? Because it leaves a much cleaner seam and actually offers greater surface area to glue. So, okay. you can hardly see it just by pushing it in. It hasn't been glued or sanded yet, see. Okay, so if you're wondering how I got the curved roof, this line here, to fit against the backdrop, which is not uh, rigid, right? It's a curved backdrop, but it just sits, it's, it floats. For those of you that have been following the channel, you know that the curved backdrops were slid into place, they're, like they're not nailed in place. 
so they move right back and forth a bit which is to your advantage when you put a building in the corner because you cut a uh, like in this case I just cut a piece of paper I taped two pieces of paper together longer than the building and I just put a put a cur like a piece of batten and just marked it and just cut a curve and I cut it like two or three times till I got it right until this piece fit against the backdrop satisfactory and then I put the building in place and then I slide this paper against the backdrop this line doesn't matter it doesn't matter right because I'm going to lay these these three panels on like this one here I'm going to trace this line on the back side of this I'm going to lay the next panel in I'm going to trace this curved line on the back side of this and this cut them out and then glue them in place and I have this pattern on the back of my roof so when I slide the building in place it fits snug against the backdrop okay jump up here. No, I wouldn't jump up here, Dusty, if I was you. You jump up onto the CA here, and you're part of the Baxton Steel Company. <laughs> Be patient there, girl. Okay, so this is the last panel going on, and I just want to say that this is the easiest building, or easiest structure to build, but the most expensive, and I'll tell you why. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times ten is what? What dust? Eighty dollars. That's right. Eighty dollars just for all the paneling to do this box, basically. Eighty bucks. So it's not always cheap to scratch build, but you get a unique building, right? Um, I would have to say that the um, the materials for the barge approach and ramp was half of this, okay, if that, 40 bucks probably, maybe, and far more complicated models. So the the very simple uh, structure costs the most, the most complicated costs less. Dusty, you're bumping the tripod, girl. Yeah, you want to be in the video, right? Okay. Okay, I just want to point this out because the uh, machining qualities of this evergreen plastic is quite good as well because it's soft, right? So I need to take this edge down to this fascia right here where initially uh, the eave trough is going to be, but I'm going to attach a, a little bit smaller scale eave just on the front of this building here, but I need to get this flush so you can take a little hobby plane like this or a small Stanley plane and just work it down that plane's nice 
Okay, so I'm just going to clean up this corner here. So in this case, I'm going to use number 293 angle. Okay, and it's a nice size. It'll just clean it up nice, just like that. Nice corner on the building there. Okay, so I just want to show you I made a mistake. So what I did was, I don't know why I did it, but I went and when I capped the roof, I covered up the eave, which was a trim all the way around the building. And for the life of me, why I did that, I do not know. So I'm not going to mess this up by because it's glued now. So um, it's just the nature of, of the game, right? Everybody does it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this little bit smaller profile, which I like a little bit better anyway, and it'll help, help uh, like it'll come out a little bit more from the face of the building and cause a little bit more of a shadow, which is what I want. So I'll use number 283H column. And then what I'll do is I'll just install that just below the ribs on the roof. And I'll make a nice little eave right there so it should look fine and dandy. Okay, so I just want to talk about these rain down spouts. Okay, there are these pipes here. They're actually square. Okay, they're square shaped. And so what I'm using for those is number 164, 80 thou by 80 thou. Okay, and so what I've done is I've measured every two inches here and I've drilled a hole, 0 0.9 millimeter hole, which matches 35 thou rod perfectly. And then I just, in four spots, drill through the, the uh, square stock first, right, and measure it, and then lay it, and then tape it on, drill a hole, put a pin in it, pull it tight, drill a hole, drill a hole, drill a hole, so it's nice and straight. So now I can lift this off, and when I install this, I can slide a spacer underneath it, so that it's a little bit away, see, a little bit away from the building, which is what I want. Okay, just to add a bit of 3D relief. That's the way the prototype is as well. Okay, so I just want to show you this vent that I'm building right here. Okay, vents are pretty basic to build actually. They're just really just squares, you know, so. But I'll show you how I do this one. So I just build it from scrap. So I just cut the backing plate, like this will get glued to the front of the building. Okay. And then you can see I've just built the back piece. I just cut a strip, in this case 15 millimeters wide, and then you can see how how I lay it on there like that just to get the small bottom piece square and then that's scribed and that'll just snap off 
and it all like I described the shape here like this just snap that off snap that off so there's the one side of it of the vent okay and then I just take this scrap and what I'll do is, is I'll just glue that as the other side here like this It's just easier to build the side profile of it first, I find, when you're working from scrap and you don't know if material is totally square, but if you get the box square, like this back side and the bottom, and then you build off of that, it'll come out square for you. And then you can just cut this when it's dry, and then you can just take your knife and just scribe a line like that, and that little nibble off that piece, and you got your vent. Okay. Okay, so I just want to talk about the letters here, the, the template uh, letters, uh, which will be cutouts, which on the prototype, they're actually probably made of aluminum or something or metal. Having it being a steel company, I'm sure it is. But um, So this is just a photograph from the actual prototypical building, which I often do. And one of the reasons why I shoot at high resolution or large files is because if I take this photo, which was about 50 yards away, I can zoom in on my desktop and I don't lose all the sharpness of the image, okay? And so I size this up with just Windows Edit to the size that I like for the actual building. And then I cut out this square from the paper, from the printer, and I just tape it onto a piece of 20 thou evergreen styrene, okay? And all you need to do is just scribe this material, any shape you want, and snap it, and it'll pop out, and you can clean it up with a nail file. So in this case, I just type the, uh, sorry, tape this down with some Tamiya tape, and then what I do is, is I just cut through the paper. I trace it with a really, really, like a new number 11 sharp blade with a really pointy tip on it. That's what you want, right? And then I do the vertical lines first, okay? And I'm not overly concerned about how accurate the cut is at first because I can touch it up with a nail file. And then once I cut these vertical or angled vertical lines like this, because I, I want to hold this template down with the tape, I don't want to do the bottom cut all the way across yet because then this tape will come, or the paper comes loose from the plastic. If I just do short verticals like this, just around the circumference of the letters, then the paper stays in place. And then once I've already or once I've scribed these vertical cuts to my satisfaction, then I'll come along with a straight edge. And in this case, I'll just run a cut down the bottom like that. Like so. And then the tops. And then I'll peel the tape off and just snap away all these letters and touch them up with a nail file. And I have them, right?
Okay, so now I've got the letters here. Now what I've done is I've packed them out with some 60 by 60 thou square stock. Number 153. And why have I done that? Because I want them to stand out from the building. That's the way the prototype is, which makes them, uh, makes the, the uh, you know, the names jump out more too, right? Because of the shadow and just the fact that they're, you know, a little ways out from the front surface of the building. Okay. And what I've done is, is I'm going to just give this a rough sound. And the reason why I'm not going to, that's for a nice bond on both sides. The reason why I'm not going to paint these first is because if I paint the building first and then paint the letters, yeah, they go on clean. But how are you going to glue the letters to the building? You can't use CA because you're just going to be gluing paint to paint and that's not going to hold. Give it two, two seasons or so in a bump and they'll fall off, right? That's what happens because the paint will break away. The glue won't, but the paint will. So this way I get a really solid bond. I get good integrity with the adhesion this way. And then when I go to paint the building, I'll just mask off the letters easy with a piece of paper in behind. No problem. Just tuck it in, spray it, airbrush it. So most of you know that's the way I like to do things by now. Okay, so now you can bleed in a little extra. And furthermore, I can put a dark wash just in behind there too, so you won't see any of that blocking, which won't matter anyway, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. 